Madam President. Sergeant in Arms. We have a distinguished guest joining us today. Sergeant Major of the Army, retired Kenneth Preston. Please escort our distinguished guest to the podium. Sergeant Major of the Army Kenneth Preston is the Vice President for Non-Commissioned Officer and Soldier Programs for the Association of the United States Army. He retired as the longest serving Sergeant Major of the Army with more than seven years in the position. Hello and good morning, everybody. Good morning. Are we motivated? Huh? Huh? So that's one of those things, it's an Air Force and Army kind of thing, you know, so it just kind of gets the blood circulating and, and motivated. Uh, Madam President, uh, thanks very much. And the executive leadership up here, I just want to say thanks for the opportunity to come in and, and speak to this uh, distinguished audience and just kind of talk about a few things this morning. And I want to recognize also, especially uh, some major retired uh, Frank Yoakum, uh, and really, the, the partnership between uh, our enlisted association and the association of the, of the Army is, is very important. And I think that as a professional development educational association, it's one of those things now, it's an opportunity for me, you know, to continue to serve and give back, you know, to those soldiers, those airmen, and the families who sacrifice and give so much. You know, as I, um, as I look around the room and I look at the, uh, the audience that's here, you know, for all the delegates in here and, uh, and the, the states that you represent. You know, I can't tell you, you know, how many times I've walked the, uh, the ground with, uh, with soldiers from, and airmen from the National Guard uh, in countries all around the world. But, uh, you know, for those out there that are retired, and I want to recognize our retired soldiers, our airmen, and our veterans out there among you, and if, I'd ask if you would just please stand for just a moment. Thank you very much. And you know, for, for all the soldiers and the airmen that were here for professional development yesterday, you know, they that wear the uniform continue to stand on your shoulders. And it's your characterization of leadership and your contributions while you're in uniform that continues to make our military the best that it is. And that's why as I look around uh, the country today with, you know, more than 280,000 uh, airmen and soldiers currently deployed or forward stationed in more than 140 countries. You know, those armies out there that we partner with, you know, look at us as the standard. And it's those partnerships out there, and whether it's a, a state partnership program, whether it's a deployment in Iraq, Afghanistan, or Syria, or it's a training mission in Eastern Europe or Korea or anywhere in the Pacific, it's absolutely amazing out there the difference that our Army National Guard is making with those countries on the ground. You know, as I, um, as I listen to all the speakers talk and, and all the things and the challenges that we've got out there that we try to work through, you know, one of the things that I thought I would contribute to the group today, and I, and I asked you to, to take notes, you know, for the delegates in here as you go back to your states and the units and organizations that you represent, you know, take these notes back so that you can pass them on. But, you know, one of the things I want to talk about is I want to talk about recruiting and retention. And for my piece of the time, I want to just kind of share with you some thoughts and ideas about, you know, the challenges that we have out there and, and really the role that all of us now as, uh, not only as retirees and veterans, but also for all of us out there that still wear the uniform, what we can do to help support our military. And, uh, you know, as General Ham said yesterday, you know, we are one army. You were one Air Force, uh, three distinct components, and when all three are properly manned, trained, equipped, um, and supported, we are ready to do the missions that we have to do. And we've got recruiters out there from all three components in each branch of the service. And of course, you know, as I look at recruiting out there, you know, I never served as a recruiter, never had that opportunity to, to earn the recruiting badge, but you know, my idea of recruiting when I came into the position as Sergeant Major of the Army was, you know, as I look at New York City as an example, and you've got, 
you know, 15 million people living in a very small populated area up there. And, and, and always when you see pictures of New York City, you see thousands of people out there walking up and down the street every day. And of course, my idea of recruiting was you take three or four recruiters, you put them out on a street corner, line up the buses, and you start stopping people as they walk up and down the sidewalk. And, you know, do you need a job? You know, what are you doing for your country? Get on the bus. And of course, you know, you fill the bus up, you send it down to Fort Jackson, South Carolina, and you put them in boots. I mean, that was recruiting in my mind. And of course, you know, as a brand new Sergeant Major of the Army coming into position, you know, recruiting command said, no, Sergeant Major, that's not how it works. So I said, okay, you got to help me understand the challenges out there of our recruiters. And, you know, when you look at the, the Army and the Air Force, I mean, we've got literally thousands of recruiters out there every day. And, um, you know, one of the things that I saw, particularly for the Army National Guard, is you know, we went through this recent drawdown of forces, you know, we kind of scaled back. And now we've had to put more recruiters back out there to get into those small corners of the country, you know, where we can find those people out there with the propensity to serve. So let me give you my little thought. And, um, you know, I had the opportunity to speak between, uh, before a, uh, the Council on Foreign Relations in New York City, uh, a number of years back when I was in uniform. And uh, as I stepped in there, and uh, General Vesey was the chairman of the Council on Foreign Relations, and uh, he introduced all of us. All the senior enlisted advisors from each of the services were there. And as he finished the introduction, in the audience there were probably 500 Fortune 500 company CEOs and senior executives, and then there was the media. And, uh, and when he opened it up after our introduction, he said, okay, these are questions you have for the panel. And, and the very first question came from the back of the room, and there was a lady that stood up, and she said, uh, I have a question for the Sergeant Major of the Army. And she said, Sergeant Major, I understand that the Army is meeting its recruiting goals, but you're targeting low-income families and ethnic minorities. And of course, I stood up and I said, the politically correct thing, ma'am, first, thank you very much for that question. And I said, first, let me say that it's not about what class of society you come from or what ethnicity you are. It's about the qualifications to wear this uniform. And then from there, I went on and kind of explained, and I used my little analogy about recruiters standing out on the street corner. And they said, no, that's not how you do it. And I said that recruiting command came back to me and they created me a pie chart. And in that pie chart, it reflected that you know, when you take the 17 to 24 age category, which we recruit more than 50% of our recruits out of that category, both men and women. And I said, when you look at that age category, only 30% are qualified to serve. And this was back, back, and now it's down to like 25% and getting smaller. But at that time, it was 30%. So, of course, my question as a Sergeant Major of the Army was, well, what's wrong with the other 70%? What disqualifies them from serving? And this is what I want you to write down, take notes, and you can take this back. And, and of course, that pie chart reflected 40% were unqualified because of education. Education is, is one of the key enablers and discriminators. And, you know, when you have a 75% graduation rate from high school, that automatically creates a deficit, particularly with those 17 to 24 age um, young men and women. And of course, you know, to come in the Army, you got to be a high school graduate, you got to have a GED equivalent. And the DOD standard that is set for all of our military services is 90% is high school graduates and 10% or less with a GED. And, uh, and I asked, okay, so why is it only 10% GED? And they said, well, those that have graduated high school have demonstrated the stick to to stick it out and, and finish their service obligation that they join up for. I said, okay, fair enough. And you know, and today, it's less than 1% with a GED right now for the young men and women that serve. And I will tell you, I'll start out by saying that the young men and women in uniform today are the cream of our society. And I'll show you that, show you why here as I go through this. Um, the other uh, enabler out there is, of course, the ASFAB test. And you go through and you take the battery of tests. And uh, you know, there's five categories, category one through five. We take nobody out of Category 5, and, uh, and the standard is, is that uh, for Category 4, the standard is for all a DOD is 4% or less out of Category 4. So 96% are Category 1, 2, 3, 
And it's three Alpha and three Bravo, both two different categories. And I asked, okay, so why is that standard? And they said, well, the general technical score on that ASFAB battery test reflects reading and comprehension skills. And when you look at the technology that we are fielding today, and whether it's a, an F-35 and you're working on it as a crew chief, um, uh, an AH-64 Apache helicopter, or an M1A2 SEP Abrams tank, I mean, there's lots of technology out there. Not to mention, as you start getting into cyber, IT, and communications, particularly satellite communications. So reading and comprehension skills is very important. Okay, so 40%, by far the biggest discriminator. 20% were disqualified for moral and physical qualifications. You know, um, Command Sergeant Major Troxel, our senior list advisor to the chairman, you know, talked about how the Guard has changed. And as I look all the way back to 9-11, and, and really you can go all the way back to, um, you know, 1989, the fall of the Iron Curtain. And when the Iron Curtain fell and Eastern Europe opened, I mean, that was the start just after the uh, Desert Shield, Desert Storm, the start of the state partnership program. Uh, and we found that the Army National Guard changed. As we began changing and using the Guard more, instead of a strategic reserve as an operational reserve, the Guard's changed to become much younger. Okay, so with that, you know, when you look at uh, physical and moral qualifications out there, you know, it becomes very important that you be physically fit. And as I tell, you know, our soldiers, our airmen out there, you got to be Air Force, you got to be Army strong, okay, to serve today. And, uh, and, of course, moral qualifications, we've got to have, you know, good, outstanding citizens that wear the uniform each and every day. And it's not only important based on minor infractions, but more importantly for the security clearances that are out there. And, uh, you know, as you look at some of the technical and classified career fields we've got, you know, you've got to have those security clearances in order to serve. And then the last 10 percent out of that 70 percent that were unqualified is, is the all others category. And it's a whole list of things. And uh, you know, it includes body piercings and tattoos and all the things that we don't allow in uniform. So, so that's the 70%. And that 30% at that time that was left over, 50% of those are the ones that go on and go to college. You know, they come from the well-off families that, that got the, uh, the financial wherewithal to, to, to pay for college. Uh, they get the academic and athletic scholarships. And then there's that group also in there that, you know, want to stay and work, work at the local Walgreens, and that's what they want to do at the, for the rest of their life. They want to stay and work the family farm. So, so the other 50% that has the propensity to serve, you know, are literally scattered across thousands and thousands of small towns and communities across our nation. And of course, that's where all of you are. You're out there in our communities each and every day. And when you look at the small recruiting stations that are out there, you'll find regular Army, regular Air Force, uh, Army and Air Guard, Army and Air Reserve, recruiters all out there working together. And as they come across, you know, those young men and women that want to serve, you know, it's about finding the right place for them. You know, and I'll tell you a little story. And, um, you know, when I was the, uh, the Fifth Corps Command Sergeant Major in Germany, and this was... Uh, you know, on 9-11, and of course, 5th Corps would go on and be the, you know, the ground force maneuver headquarters for the invasion of Iraq, and then it would become the, uh, the combined Joint Task Force 7 headquarters in Iraq for the whole first year. And, uh, but my, uh, my driver in 5th Corps was, uh, was a young sergeant named uh, Ken Payne. And, uh, and Kenny was, uh, was a great young man. He was a great infantry soldier, uh, spent time in the 82nd Airborne, was part of the the 173rd over there in Italy, and of course got pulled into the 5th Corps headquarters, and he was there when I arrived. And uh, so he was my driver and, uh, and really my confidant as we traveled all over Europe. And then as we deployed into Iraq, you know, he was promoted to staff sergeant, and he really became the NCIC of my security detachment. Now, he was a young man from Ohio, and... Um, you know, one of the things that, uh, you know, he realized was that his father, who had a construction business, was getting up there in age and really wanted him to come back and take over the family business. And him and I, you know, even after I was selected to be Sergeant Major of the Army, he followed me back to the Pentagon and, you know, for the first year or so was, was a travel coordinator for me. And, um, and we talked about it. 
what was the right thing for him to do. And his decision was to, to leave the regular army, transition into the Army National Guard, to serve as a National Guard recruiter, but also to be able to work the family business. And I think that when you look at the three components out there for the Army and the Air Force, Guard, Reserve, and regular forces, there's young men and women out there that have the right place to fit in each one of those. And, uh, and I ask you to kind of, in your corners out there, to tell the soldier, the airman's story, and, uh, and help them understand the opportunities out there that military service can provide. You know, for me, I will tell you that uh, the Army changed my life. And uh, I didn't grow up around a military family. I was very fortunate that my mother and father both served. You know, my father served in the Army. My mom served in the Air Force. Uh, both Korean War era veterans. My mom was a staff sergeant uh, when she left the Air Force in 1955. And, uh, you know, my father was a PFC. And, uh, you know, of course, I grew up in the mountains of uh, Western Maryland, very remote community up there that you're very proud of. But there's no doubt in my mind that my parents, you know, put that idea in my mind that, you know, military service was one of those things to consider as an option as I was getting up there into my high school years and thinking about what was next. And, and I knew when I made the decision to come into military service, my intent was to do my four-year obligation, take the Montgomery GI Bill, get out, go to college, and become an architect. And just like the rest of my family, continued to serve, whether it was in the Guard or in the Reserve, as my son has done. So I ask you all to continue to tell the soldier story. Madam President, all of our distinguished guests, I say thank you for this opportunity to stand here before you and, and say thank you for your partnership and your support with our Army's Association, because together we are one team. And, and for the airmen, as well as the soldiers out there, you know, I do a newsletter twice a week, and it's all based on professional development, education, leadership, and mentorship. And it's my opportunity to continue to serve, and I thank you all very much, and God bless. Sergeant Major. We just want to thank you for your comments and for all your support of the, all of our Army National Guard and Air National Guard soldiers and airmen throughout the United States and Ingus. We're, it's always such a pleasure to have you here at our conference. So we Thanks appreciate it. Thank all you right. very much. Thank right. you. Garden and Arm, please escort our distinguished guests from the podium. Okay, we're going to move into some reports. So I now call on Master Sergeant Dan Riley for the final rules and credentials report. Committee on Credentials and Rules met on August 6, 2019, from 0900 to 0930 at the Iowa Event Center. Delegate badges were issued as follow. Authorized delegates, 251. Issued badges, 195. Proxies granted, 49. And total delegate votes for 244. The following states or territories do not have credentials issued. Guam, Kentucky, Puerto Rico, and the Virgin Islands. Madam President, this is my final report, and I move for its approval. This is an informational report and requires no action. Without objection, the report will be filed. At this time, I call on Command Chief Master Sergeant Retired Rosemary Marston to give the Committee on Scholarship report.
Good morning. The 2019 Angus Scholarship Program was open from January 21st, 2019 through May 1st, 2019. During that time, there were a total of 310 scholarship applications received for various Angus and partner university scholarships. This year's program awarded a total of 26 scholarships. Six Command Sergeant Major Virgil R. Williams scholarships, thanks to sponsorship provided by USAA and AFBA. Five Patriot scholarships, thanks to individual donations received by Frank and Nori Yoakum, Bobby Bourne, and the estate of Harvey Goldstein. One sponsorship provided by the Command Sergeant's Major Advisory Council for a total of 17,500 in sponsorship and donations. In addition, due to the generosity of partner universities, three scholarships were awarded from American Intercontinental University, two from American Public University, two from Colorado Technical University, two from Grand Canyon University, two from Grantham University, and three from University of Phoenix. This concludes the Scholarship Committee report. This report is for information only, and I request that it, request that it be filed. Thank you, Chair Marston. I think we had some slides, but we, she covered everything, I believe, and then the rest of uh, the scholarship awardees will be recognized at the banquet on Wednesday night. So this was an information report and requires no action without objection. The report will be filed. Okay, I now call on Senior Master Sergeant Celia Losi for the Committee on Awards Report. The Special Committee on Publications Chair Andy Strauss will assist in presentation of this year's Publications Awards. The Ingus Awards Committee met on August 5th, 2019 from 1530 to 1645 with 12 members in attendance. Items that were discussed were SOP changes, lack of nomination submissions, recommendations on how to improve submissions for next year, and updates to current certificates and trophies. The committee received and reviewed 16 award nominations this year. These awards will be presented tomorrow evening at the Allstates Banquet. Will President Craig and the Publications Chair, Mr. Strauss, please come forward to make your presentation. The Special Committee's Committee reviewed all category submissions for publication awards. The following were selected as award winners. Category one, commercial entry, no entries. Category two, semi-commercial entry. There was a tie for first place between Buckeyes Bulletin, Wisconsin, and Iowa Guard Post, Iowa. Third place going to The Voice, Ohio. All three entries were outstanding examples of newsletters. Category three, no entries. Category four, combined associations entry. The winner is Nagat News Magazine, Texas.
Category five, Ingus area publications entry, no entries. Category six, state auxiliary newsletters entry. The winners are first place to the Dogwood Blossom, Virginia, and second place to Mountaineer, West Virginia. Category seven, Angus Area Auxiliary Newsletter. The winner is Cadence Area Two. <laughs> Category eight, non-commercial website entry. The winner is Texas Angus for www.ngat.org. Category nine, commercial website entry. The winner is Wisconsin for www.wngea.org. Category 10, state promotional items. The winner is Wisconsin Angus. <laughs> Category 11 and 12, both no names submitted. This is unfortunate since National is always looking for contributors to our publications. Madam President, this report is for information only and I request that it be filed. Thank you, Chair Alosi. This was an informational report and requires no action. Without objection, the report will be filed. And we look forward to Wednesday evening when the, all the other awards that were approved this year by the committee uh, will be presented. All right, and congratulations again. Let's give another round of applause to all the publications winners. Okay, I now call on past president, chief master, sergeant, retired John Harris for the nominations report. All right, for area one, the elected director heir was John Green. The elected director army was Thomas Slowinski. The elected area chair is Janine Manorino. Area two, the elected director heir, Robert Barnett. Elected director army, Tony McGraw. And elected chairman, Chad Ratu. Area three, do not have any election results, but we have, well, did Area 3 finish their elections? All right, don't have the election results, uh, so I'll announce that next, uh, next report. Uh, area 4, do not have election results. Uh, area 5, Director Air, Charles Kaysen. <clears throat> Director Army, Josh Wormers. Elected Chair, Charles Kaysen. Area six, Director Air Stephen Hagen, Director Army Scott Evans, and Area Chair Stephen Hagen. Area seven, uh, I don't have the official names for Area seven, so I need those as well. And that concludes the report. Thank you. This was an interim report and requires no further action at this time. 
Okay, so at this point, I think we're a little bit ahead of the game. We're gonna do some um, raffles. We have raffles ready to go. Do we have the box back there? Yes, ma'am. All right. It's a matter if you went through. All right, we're pulling four. We got a few, I got a few gift cards here, and then we got a list of some other items that we'll do. Uh, first one, we've got a $50 Target gift card. So we want to pull for that. Get All right, here. we have an Eric Danielson. Eric Danielson. Outstanding. There he is. All right. Okay. They just get in before we'll wait. No, he'll bring it. You want to do yours? Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead and explain what you got next. All right. So this is from one of the vendors. This is from uh, Greg Kennedy, who is with Tactical Lighting Solutions. That's the booth that you see out there with all the, I don't know, glow sticks, right? Uh, so what they've donated is a map reading case that is illuminated by one of the glow sticks, got the plastic insert. Um, he said it's worth millions of dollars. <laughs> so if you can pull a name for that. Tabitha Carr. No, the vendor explained that it was very durable and does not break. All right, I'll go ahead and we'll do another uh, gift card. I got a $50 Home Depot gift card, so let's draw for that one. What? Tom Myers. Tom Myers from Maryland. All right, who wants a big screen TV? Oh. <laughs> All right, this one's going to be for one of two big screen TVs we'll give away this conference. Mike Strum. No, no, no. <laughs> Is he, he's not here, right? He's not in the room? Seriously? No, come on, you don't want it? Now, it's only a 20-inch big screen TV. <laughs> it's not here. All right, uh, so we will have that uh, shipped to you. And then one more name for, this one is for the IDEA FPV, whatever that means, RC drone with a 1080p wide-angle camera, HD, live, super secret, squirrel, wow. spy on your neighbors. Jessica... Wilkins. Jessica Wilkinson. Wilkins. Is that a PD? Wilkins. Wilkins. Is that PD? Does not, nope. What state? Sorry, sir. Area code 906. Anybody? Mm. Well, if it's PD, we don't want to penalize them. All right, how about pull another one and keep that one on the side and we'll figure it out. Because we're giving away multiple drones as well. Alex Goldfarb? PD. PD? All right, very good. Hang on to that one. And we have more drones, battery backup packs for phones, and another big screen TV for tomorrow. Madam President, we have one more from Arkansas. Right, okay. 
Uh, good morning, I'm with the Little Rock Convention and Visitors Bureau, and on behalf of the entire city of Little Rock, we're super excited to um, host your conference next year. We'll hope you'll come. Uh, bring your families, there's lots to do within walking distance. Um, so at my uh, booth, we were doing a drawing for this gift basket, Little Rock themed items, and we drew by random number, and Steve Harmon is the winner. So he can come by our booth, 119, and pick this up. You know and what? then they, they are still selling raffle tickets for the five night stay, so, um, and they're going to do that drawing uh, Wednesday evening. Okay. Okay. Got it. Thank you so much. That's from Kansas. Okay, at this time I'll call on Secretary Thompson. Do you have any other administrative announcements? Okay, host state conference chair Kennebec. Tell us what's going on this evening, huh? Yes, this evening. What is this evening? What day is it? Oh yeah. Um, we're gonna start running buses about 1530. So you have to be a little patient with us tonight. It's like a 20 minute drive to get up to Camp Dodge but it is like one of the most beautiful setups for all area hospitality night. So it's gonna work out great. Um, so the buses will start at 1530. They'll make rounds back and forth and uh, then we'll have everybody there hopefully by six o'clock. To go along with the pool pavilion, um, the uh, museum, the Gold Star Museum on Camp Dodge, which is just adjacent to the pool pavilion will be open this evening from six to nine. Please go in there, see it. They've recently remodeled. There's an actual periscope in there. You can look around Camp Dodge. Uh, a lot of in interesting information in there. So please go in and see them while you're there. Um, it'll help get you out of the cold or the heat a little bit too. So um, other than that, that is all I have. Oh, yes, I forgot about that. So tomorrow morning, there is a fun run uh, for anybody that is interested in going, uh, we have a couple of marathoners here in the state, so they thought this would be nice. Uh, zero seven o'clock outside. Just on the parking lot behind, uh, to the west, I'm sorry, to the east of Hilton. The Hilton. Okay. So just east of the Hilton, they'll line up out there at zero seven and they got about a 5k run set up. Yes. Yep. So we hope to see as many people out there that would like to go. Thank you. Okay, so we're getting ready to break for lunch early, uh, but before we do, just a reminder again, the exhibit hall and the auxiliary silent auction will be closing at 1400 hours today. Again, please visit those vendors. Um, I will tell you, they, from what I've heard, they've been very happy with the flow and stuff, but let's give them one more push before they uh, pack up this afternoon. Also, don't forget to visit the Ingus booth. We've got those cookbooks still out there. We've got the Ingus shirts. Um, and actually, as of this morning, we were reducing the prices a little bit because we want to try and not have to take those back to the national office. So the men's shirts are being reduced from 27 to 25, and the women's shirts are being reduced from 27 to 24, because we have quite a few women's shirts. And I know there were some sizing issues, so, but if you'd like those or you think somebody in your state would like those, purchase those and take them home with you. Uh, we also have our limited edition Enlisted Guardians print out there. They're on sale for just $25. Those are numbered prints. They come with a certificate of authenticity um, and make a great gift uh, for somebody retiring or presentation at your unit or your wing. So again, take a look at that and you can pick one up here and take it home with you. The other thing that's been going on, we started with the Kind of we're targeting the uh, new, the PDs, but we are this week giving for anybody that is a new member. So we've had people who are here present and you're, if you're, uh, shouldn't be anybody on the delegate floor, but if your membership expired and you're not a current member on our rolls, any of your PDs who are not members, this is a good time for them to sign up. And if they do, they can take their phone where they show that they paid 
uh, to the Ingus booth, and get, we have the nice thermal bottles. There's one that was blue. There's a black one. They had them on display last night at the uh, junior enlisted night. So any new members, uh, we're trying to, we've got some of those left that we would like to get to anybody that signs up as a new member is just kind of a thank you. Now, should we not uh, get rid of them all today? Probably tomorrow we will be selling those for anybody else who's had their eye on those and would like to have one. They're very, very nice, turned out great. All right, um, believe at this point, this is a reminder also, this afternoon is the Army and Air Guard breakouts with Sergeant Major Sampa and Chief Master Sergeant Anderson. So those breakout sessions for Army and Air individually start at 1,300 hours. So and I would encourage you all to attend. There should be a lot of good information put out at that. So at that point, uh, again, just reminder, please enjoy this evening's festivities, but please be safe and watch out for each other out there. We will now stand in recess until tomorrow, August 7th at 0900 hours. <laughs>